We'll talk a little bit about your experience being in solitary. I want to let everyone know that your glasses are actually because you spent so long in solitary confinement that the light is something I that you're quite sensitive to. I didn't see sunlight for almost a decade. Okay. That's um, not usually what we think of solitary confinement, that you usually you, you let out into the yard for a while. That didn't happen? No, that's only on TV. Uh, they say you're allowed out of your cell for an hour a day, but what that means is they take you out of your cell and put you in another cell. Oh, I see. Yeah. I want to go over some of the details. In 1993, three eight-year-old boys, as we heard, Christopher Byer, Stephen Branch, and Michael Moore were savagely murdered. You and your friend Jason Baldwin, along with an acquaintance, Jesse McK um, Miss Kelly, were arrested for this crime um, within days, I believe. What led, initially, the police to arrest the three of you? A lot of it was just because we, we came from a really small, hardcore fundamentalist town where we did not fit in. Okay. Just the way we looked, the you music we listened to. Exactly. It, it, automatically put a target on our backs. And then the police actually labeled you as the ringleader, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. As this group, how and so? The, I think it was mostly because I, I was the one the media chose to focus on. Um, you know, you could obviously tell by looking at Jesse Miss Kelly that he was, you know, not highly functioning. So he wasn't that frightening. Uh, Jason Baldwin looked like a typical 16 year old kid. So he wasn't that frightening. They thought I was the one that looked the most sensational, so I was the one they focused all the attention on. And in, in 1993, I mean, law enforcement was just learning about satanic cults, and they were attributing all of these, you know, murders that were unusual to satanic cults. They said that you as a ringleader were a member of a satanic cult, were you? No. You know, we were no more Satanists than the people they hung in Salem were Satanists. But they couldn't come up with another motive for this crime, so that's what they went with. You know, it says, the, the uh, documentary suggests that the police force uh, Mr. Miss Kelly, who was mentally challenged, right. uh, that they forced him to make a false co uh, confession and, they, and right. say that you organized the murders. So where were you that day? Now, did you organize the murders? I was actually at home. You know, they had uh, s many people that could have told them where I was, people that I was on the phone with, people that were in the house with me. Did they check your alibi? Yeah, but they never called them in court. They never let them testify. I mean, even with Jesse Miss Kelly, the guy who was confessing, they have photos and logbooks showing him signing in right. to another place but, when the murders happened. Even though, even though yeah. Jesse ended up uh, giving an admission, he never would testify against you guys, even though they said, we'll give you less time, we'll give you less time. Right. And that, were you friends? I wasn't friends with Jesse, though I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. We were acquaintances. I would see him around the neighborhood. Jason Baldwin, the guy that I went to trial with, was my best friend. Gosh. When well, they were throwing you know, all these so-called, these lies at you, and the, the, what did you do to defend yourself? What did you, you can't do anything. You know, you have to keep in mind, I'm barely more than a child myself. I'm 18 years old. I'm in a state of extreme shock and trauma yeah. because I've had my entire world ripped apart, my entire mm. life yeah. destroyed. Yeah. And, you know, I had no experience with anything like that, right. so there wasn't much I could do. Uh -huh. Damien, in the clip that we saw, there was that shot of you smiling, which I think a lot of people remember. Some people were saying your behavior at the time um, involved smirking, seemed evil as they deemed it. Um, when you look back, do you feel as though your behavior was evil at the time? Do you think it gave them any reason to believe that oh, you did this? Well, right. I think that it was taken out of context. Sure. Like that scene you just see with me looking out the back of the cop car smiling, I'm trying to reassure my family that oh. I'm okay. They're standing oh. in the back. Yeah. But yeah. They, you don't see that. All right. you see is, you it's know, fun. that little set. Yeah. What's so incredible, in a death penalty case, there was no DNA of the three of you connecting you to anything at the crime scene. And interestingly enough, the DNA of one of the stepfathers in the actual ligature. Yes. And that you have a confession of someone who won't testify against you. And you're convicted not just of murder, but you're sentenced to death. I mean, death penalty cases should be super due process. Yes. I mean, what did you think? When you were convicted and sentenced to death, th there was no evidence. You can't really think. I mean, when you're standing there in the courtroom, the only thing I can compare it to is if you've ever been beaten. You know, when you get punched in the head, it's like a bright flash of light mm -hmm. and loud noises, and you're really disoriented. And it doesn't even always register as pain at first. Whenever you hear yourself, they sentenced me to death three times. Oh, gosh. And whenever you hear them doing that, it's like being beat in the head sure. repeatedly. I know someone would ask how, how one would maintain any, any sense of hope, um, but many high-profile celebrities came to your defense. I mean, Johnny Depp, Pearl Jam's Eddie Vedder, um, Natalie Maines from the Dixie Chicks. Director Peter Jackson actually funded part of your defense. So what was your reaction when you realized that there was this support system out there? It makes, you, out? it makes you feel like you've got a, a fighting chance for once. You know, sure. one individual can't really fight the state. It's like an insect trying to fight a steamroller. So it makes you feel that finally, you know, you do have some sort of hope, but at the same time, you know, on a daily basis, you're just trying to survive life in prison.
We're back with one of the West Memphis Three, Damian Echols, and we're joined by the woman he married on death row, Lori Davis, and the director of the documentary West of Memphis, Amy Bird. Welcome, Lori and Amy. Thank you. Now, Lori, before you met Damien, you were living a, a normal life. You lived in uh, Brooklyn and Park Slope. You were an architect, a landscape architect. I mean, you were doing what regular normal people do. How in the world did you end up marrying a man on death row? It's a long story. I, I saw Paradise Lost, the okay. first documentary. Um, it screened at MoMA in 1996, and it just hit me like a freight train. The story, the injustice, everything about it. I was raised in the South, okay. so I understood the culture, um, and I understood what it was like to be a little bit different in my mm -hmm. community. Sure. So I just felt an affinity for Damien, and I reached out for, to him, wrote him a letter, sent him some books, and then from there on out, it was just... Mm. <laughs> well, how did your family take that, that you were, you were communicating with a guy on death row? Well, I waited for four years to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> but what you did was you actually picked up and moved to Arkansas so you could be near him while he was on death row. Now, as a judge, I would marry some people before they went to prison, before one of them went to prison, but they usually kind of knew each other, had a little physical contact. That didn't happen. You made the move. You were all in before you actually write no physical yeah. contact. What happened yeah. there? You know, I, I just kept instinctually taking the next step. And um, Damien is an extraordinary person. And we had corresponded, a great deal of correspondence. I think we have 5,000 letters between the two of us by this point. But wrote to each other, talked to each other a great deal. And of course, I had to study up on the case and, and learn everything about it. But I just knew. He was extraordinary, and I was never going to find anyone like him again, and I was just in it from, from the beginning. Now, Amy, a lot of celebrities came to uh, Damon's defense, a ton of them. But what eventually led to him being freed? Well, it wasn't just one thing. It was the celebrities, actually, their involvement was mm -hmm. a plus in so many ways behind the scenes. But down in Arkansas, celebrity support is just, it's was not he? a good thing. Okay. It's Hollywood, and it's no. not true. Mm -hmm. So, um, really, um, when Dennis Reardon took this case to the uh, Supreme Court and he challenged the, stat the DNA statute in the state of Arkansas, there was this palpable shift, and suddenly everyone was able to kind of come out and support Damien publicly, support all three of the guys publicly, and everything started to move from there, and they were granted a new trial, but then all the delays set in, as you right. know. And it, what's amazing is that there was absolutely no DNA evidence. But one of the things, Amy, that you talked about and brought out was this thing about turtles. Why don't you tell us? Mm. Well, th these guys were convicted based on the autopsy photos. They were, they were convicted based on the satanic nature of these crimes. But if you actually do research, we worked with many forensics experts and spoke to everyone, and they unanimously said that these were not... Stab wounds. There was no depth to any of the wounds. These mm -hmm. were just scratch marks. So basically, they were being judged on something that had nothing to do with the crime. And you have to basically start from the beginning at that point and look at the post-mortem activity. And that's and, ultimately... And, but, but you start, talked about the turtles, the turtle snappers, that the post-mortem injuries, the animal predation. Right. And where the bodies were found was in a bayou right in West Memphis. And there were Snapping turtles, if you, I don't know if you know about snapping turtles. I didn't when I went down there. They're 110 pounds. They're, they're like prehistoric beasts. And they can really hurt you. They can hurt you. And they migrate towards corpses. Oh, so it, was, it became something that well, seemed awful. very obvious. So nobody brought that up at all oh. during the trial. Well, the medical examiner in Arkansas actually is a turtle expert, and he breeds his own snapping turtles. I don't know why this never went anywhere, but nobody so really... Then we because find the out prosecutor that... wanted to say mm -hmm. that a knife was used, and then they, in, within minutes of going into water, three minutes, I think, they found a knife. And so they said, that's the weapon. It was part of the satanic cult. That's why they didn't go to the turtle yeah. thing. And then you have these incredible MEs from around the country who came to testify on your behalf. I know, it's it, it, absolutely crazy. Now, you, you, you were freed, but then who do you think did this, yeah. these heinous murders? Yeah, who, who did it? Of the little boys. We actually say we shouldn't have to point the finger. That's what the evidence should be for. We have evidence now. We have DNA found at the crime scene that puts, matches one of the victim's stepfathers and the man who is providing the stepfather with an alibi.